Welcome back, Exile, to another installment in Noodle's complete lore series. This video covers Act 6. Let's get started. At the end of Act 5, Sin saves us from Kitava and flies us to the docks of Oriath, where we meet a new character named Lily Roth. Lily Roth offers to sail us to Rayclass to escape Oriath and Kitava. Lily takes us to Lion Eye's Watch, where our adventure began. Lily Roth is a pirate, although she prefers the term nautical entrepreneur. She is the granddaughter of the infamous pirate Whalem Roth. She has made a name for herself as well. The bandits Creighton, Alira, and Oak from Act 2 were all working with Lily to recover an ancient map when the three of them were caught and exiled to Rayclast. Lily seems to know many of the characters we have previously met. She has quite the history with Tarklay from Act 1 and now Act 6. Tarklay and Lily Roth used to work together as smugglers and lovers. But Lily suspected that Tarklay was developing some deep feels like wanting to settle down and have children. So Lily left him tied up on Penance Quay to be captured. This is how Tarkley was exiled to Rayclast. Bestel has never met Lily Roth, but he knows of her because he is a huge fan of pirates like Captain Fairgraves and Whalem Roth. Bestel is incredibly happy to see Whalem's granddaughter in Lion Eye's Watch. Tarkley, not so much, but Nessa is nowhere to be seen. Even though we were thoroughly defeated by Kitava, Sin tells us that there is a way to destroy Kitava still. Since Sin created the beast, he has intimate knowledge of it, and claims that the beast still remains in some sliver of its former self. The beast's downfall was being connected to Malachi, who left remnants of his mortality in the form of organs. However, these ties to mortality through Malachi will now allow us to revive the beast. Malachi resurrected his three students, Chevron, Malagaro, and Doedre, to guard Malachi's organs. These three organs were represented in the Act 4 Malachi fight by the three bleeding hearts we destroyed. Now, Sin believes we can restore some of the beast's power, what had kept Kitava and the other gods at bay for centuries, by restoring these three hearts with three souls. It seems fitting that those three souls should be the same three who guarded the organs previously. Sin senses that Chevron's spirit has returned to the prison after the beast's death. Tarkley tells us he saw Nessa run out at night to the mudflats, and when he called to her, she did not respond. She was too quick to catch, but Tarkley followed her tracks until they simply vanished. Besides Nessa going missing, the fall of the beast seems to have worsened the situation for Lion Eye's watch. The dead from shipwrecks have washed up and begun terrorizing the watch, and while the enraged animals are mostly gone, they have been replaced by strange monsters and humanoids. Lily asks us to kill the undead who are rising on the Twilight Strand as our payment for her sailing us to Oriath. Bestel, in an attempt to bring cheer to the remaining survivors, wants us to find his body manuscript he lost in the Marigold's shipwreck. Tarkley wants us to find Nessa. The undead Oriath that have washed ashore look relatively unchanged, but farther north on the coast and the mudflats are monsters that look like risen Karui with long arms made out of weapons. These monsters are called Tukahama scouts, warriors, or vanguards. Since the Karui god Kitava is alive, and Kitava's cultists run a rampant in Oriath, it makes sense that other gods and their followers have risen as well. As we search for Nessa in the mudflats, we see a new gate blocking our way to an area called the Karui Fortress. We find the key to opening this gate by killing a unique Tukahama scout called the Dishonored Queen. Editing Noodle here, I just want to address that some people believe that the Dishonored Queen we see is Queen Hiri. This is supported by the fact that she is called a queen and because she shoots arrows. However, I could not find any concrete evidence to support this, as Hiri was traveling back to Namakanui with the rest of the Karui last time we heard about her from Lavianja and Kalm's writings in Acts 1 and 4. And we've seen people come back to Rayclast, i.e. Doreso, but these were as spirits brought back by the power of Nightmare, and obviously the beast is no longer around. So I just wanted to address that, although I couldn't find any concrete evidence and didn't want to include it unless I could find something to prove that she is, in fact, Hiri. This key is called the Eye of Conquest. This name is reminiscent of Kaum's Eye of Fury from Act 4, but its flavor text 
as a prayer to Tukahama. Weakness must be purged, lest it poison the blood of all Karui. Behind the dishonored queen, we find Nessa partially in the cave by the waterfall that led to the submerged passage. She is mostly submerged in the water, now flooding the cave once again. Nessa tells us that the King of Brine did this to her, and that he wants something from her. She seems to have broken some form of mind control to warn us about this Brine King. She clutches her hand to her chest while she tells us this, and then suddenly dives into the water headfirst, revealing that she's been turned into a gosh dang mermaid. Fun fact, right before Nessa dives into the water, she moves her hand and we can see she is wearing a very familiar necklace as certain other fishy lady wore in Act 1, the star of Rayclast. With Nessa's second disappearance, we continue on past the gate to the Karui Fortress. In the middle of the area, we find what looks like an arena. Upon entering it, we are greeted by Tukahama himself, the Karui god of war. We've discussed Tukahama briefly when mentioning Kaum in Acts 1 and 4 because Kaum was a fervent follower of the ways of Tukahama. As we learned in Act 4, before Tukahama, the Karui were peaceful farmers and fishermen. Now, the Karui are known for being fearsome warriors, so Tukahama has great influence over the Karui. Under Tukahama's leadership, the Karui began many wars and conquests, specifically against the first ones of Ezimir, which, fun fact, are the bestiary bosses or spirit beasts. So, Sakawal, Kratian, Benemis, and Ferul. Sin tells us, battle by battle, war by war, Tukahama carved the steps that would carry him up a mountain of severed heads and into immortality. This implies Tukahama was once a mortal, and ascended to a god through his actions, unlike the primal god Kitava. When we defeat Tukahama, Sin appears. He draws some power from Tukahama's body and tells us that we can use the power of the gods we defeat to strengthen ourselves. These powers appear in our pantheon. Tukahama is the first god we have encountered since Kitava, but he will be one of many that we may defeat and gain pantheon powers from. Fun fact, the word pantheon means all the gods of a people or religion collectively, so it's basically a pokedex of god powers we will be able to use. From the Karui Fortress we access the ridge, which is a familiar path to the Axiom prison where Chevron has returned. Chevron's spirit has returned to the prison because Brutus was always her finest work, and her restless spirit was drawn back to this place to continue her experiments. We make our way through the prison to the rooftop. Chevron waits for us on the roof, now in the form of Chevron the Returned. We catch her working over Brutus's strapped down corpse. She reanimates Brutus and we fight him. Then we fight Chevron, and both fights are very similar to their original counterparts. In the final phase, Chevron merges with Brutus to become the dreaded Chevrutus and gives her lightning magic to his powerful slams. Fun fact, this form is not actually named Chevrutus, it's named Reassembled Brutus, which is lame. When we slay Chevrutus, Sin is able to extract Chevron's soul for our purposes of restoring the beast. We exit the prison to the prisoner's gate, although we must eventually follow the path forward if we travel down the slopes of the area we find a new side area called the Valley of the Fire Drinker. Inside is another minor god, Aberath, who is a giant goat man. Aberath is not a Karui god like Tukahama or Kitava. His national origins are unknown. When Aberath was a man, he was an alchemist known as the Scholar King. Aberath would take goats and burn away the flesh to liquidate the life force within, and would consume this liquid. That is how he turned into the first goat man. Every goat man we have seen in the world thus far originated from Aberath, now known as the Cloven One. Aberath stole a woman to mate with, and all of his children and children's children are these goat men, including Fawn, the large goat man who kept Navali captive in Act 1. Every goat man must steal a woman to father more goat men, which is quite a terrible fate. We kill Aberath, the Cloven One, and can utilize his power in our pantheon. Because we opened the thaumaturgical gate sealed by piety between Act 1 and 2, 
we can now travel directly from the prison into the western forest, where Alira once resided. We run straight through the western forest into the riverways. While our main quest lies further north still, we can go to the wetlands, where Oak used to reside, to find another god that has risen. The creatures residing in the wetlands have been infected with a parasite spread by this god, named Rizlatha, the Puppet Mistress. Rizlatha, the Puppet Mistress, is an Asmiri god. Before Rizlatha was a god, she was the leader of a large and peaceful Asmiri tribe. Her tribe was attacked and destroyed by none other than Tukahama, the Karui god of war. Many of the tribe's people killed were Rizlatha's own children. Rizlatha wanted to revive her slaughtered tribe, and in her rage and desperation became a parasitic bug capable of spawning many mindless children to repopulate and take over the area. Her influence is spreading as she can not only create children, but can turn other creatures into her children. We find her nest, slaughter her children once more, and kill Rizlatha, the puppet mistress, to add her power to our pantheon. We continue through the riverways and find that the forest encampment entrance has been blocked off, but we can go south to the southern forest where we entered Act 2 after killing Mervale. Eventually we find the entrance to the Cavern of Anger where Mervale was living. When we go inside, we see Nessa in full mermaid form sing on a rock in front of a flag chest. When we open the chest, the black flag is inside. Nessa tells us that the Brian King's time has almost come and Nessa must go to him. But the black flag before us was once the flag of Whalem Roth's ship, the Black Crest. Nessa tells us that we can put this flag in the beacon to summon Whalem Roth, who can take us to where the Brian King and Nessa now reside. We can now clearly see the Star of Rayclast around Nessa's neck, the necklace that cursed Mervale. Nessa dives into the water behind her once more, and we make our way through the giant cave system to a new beach. We travel along the beach until we find the giant beacon that Nessa told us about. We light the beacon and toss in the flag, which turns the beacon's light dark red and brings darkness to the surrounding area. A large black ship appears below, which can only be the black crest that Whalem Roth captained. Whalem Rottooth is Lily's grandfather, as we know. Whalem, although dead, seems to have been taken by a curse similar to Captain Fairgraves, a spirit chained to his own ship, and he must serve us because we summoned him. When Whalem was alive, he was a Brynrot warband leader and captain of the Black Crest. It is said that the whole of this ship is made of the bones of a leviathan Whalem killed. Whalem's own sister, Lucy the Rot Mother, betrayed him and left him on an island so she could lead his warband. Whalem lost much of his infamy from that incident, and the Brynrot pirates became more crazed than notorious. To regain some status, Whalem attempted to kill Mervale and died. Somehow, his spirit is still attached to his ship. Whalem sails us out east to a place called the Brine King's Reef. The area is infested with undead Brynrot pirates, possibly those sacrificed to the Brine King for many years. We have found warnings of the Brine King scattered throughout Act 6, beyond what Nessa has mentioned. Lily tells us that all pirates used to drown mutineers during the full moons to appease the Brine King, and Whalem confirms this tale. On the Twilight Strand, we find a message in a bottle from First Mate Pickin, detailing how his ship, manned by Captain Caruso, was overtaken by a large wave that covered the ship in crabs. A green light came from the sea as the crabs destroyed and ate any sailors they could reach. As the crew tried to escape on longboats, Pickin saw the Brian King himself, who overturned the ship. Pickin wrote this message in a bottle, knowing the ship and its crew were doomed. At the beacon, we find the Templar Report, written by General Markovius. Markovius writes to Avarius, entreating that Avarius stop sending ships out to catch Brynrot pirates, as the Brian King was destroying all the ships. Both of these reports are from recent events. The Brian King is also known as Soagoth. The ancient map that Creighton, Alira, and Oak tried to retrieve with Lily was a map to the sunken city of Soatha, where the Brian King rules under the ocean. Soagoth is another Asmiri god, 
but one that pirates and seafarers worldwide worshipped and feared. Soagoth was once a man. Sin tells us that he met Soagoth when he was a seafaring captain, the beloved leader of a prosperous and sprawling fisher tribe. Apparently all of Soagoth's children were born monsters who were unfit to rule. Sin says this was a curse of legacy and that a truly noble king would have surrendered his kingdom to cleaner blood. Soagoth, in desperation and vanity, continued to take wife after wife. It is said that he grew his shell to shield himself from the shame of his unworthy children. Lily says that in the city of Sawatha, before it sank to the bottom of the ocean, all the citizens were either eaten by the Brine King or picked to try to continue his family line. Near the beacon we find a letter from Benric. It details his wife being taken by the Brine King out to sea. This is also likely the fate of Nessa. We enter the Brine King's throne and find Nessa sitting upon a large, suspicious rock. She greets us, but this time her tone is not of fear, it's of smug contempt. Nessa and the Brine King have wanted us to arrive all this time, as a gift of either sacrifice or bride for Soagoth, depending on your chosen exile's gender. The Brine King wants to take his practices from Sawatha and implement them on the surface, now that he is free from the slumber imposed by the beast. Nessa is raised up, and we see that she is attached like an anglerfish's bobble to this giant crab, the Brine King. We must kill Soagoth and his army of crabs, and upon doing so, we get our first major god in the Pantheon. Whalem Roth returns in his ship, shocked that we killed the deity that he and every pirate before him feared and sacrificed to. Whalem is so impressed he offers to sail us to Act 7 to continue our quest to destroy the returned gods and bring down Kitaba. Thank you so much for watching, it's your boy Noodle. If you like this video and this series, give this a thumbs up. Check out the playlist below for more of the videos. If you have any questions about the series, please check out my stream, twitch.tv slash kittencatnoodle. And until next time, stay sane, exile.